Hi, my name is Sheila. In this video, we are going to be talking about the probable cause affidavit that was just unsealed, just released to the public so that we can break down all the information that the police used to put together enough evidence to get an arrest warrant for alleged Idaho student murderer, uh, Brian Koberger. Yeah. I have not really been ready to jump right into this case, primarily because I'm a mom and I have a daughter who is a college student. So this just was uncomfortable for, you know, a lot of reasons. You hate to see young people um, murdered. It's it just the whole thing is just horrific and traumatic. But the document has been unsealed. So I do want to pop over to that take a look at it and start to uh, figure out what has been going on with this. All right, sta uh, statement of Brett Payne. What do I need to get rid of here? Let's get rid of this. Statement of Brett Payne. All right, uh, duly appointed, qualified, and acting peace officer within the county of Lata. I guess that's how you say that, state of Idaho employed in the Moscow Police Department in the official capacity of Corporal and has been uh, in that position for four years. Corporal Payne is being assisted by members of the Idaho State Police and agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. All right, so now we get to when he arrived there and what happened. On November 13th, 2022, at approximately 4 p.m., Moscow Police Department MPD Sergeant Blaker and I responded to 1122 King Road, Moscow, Idaho, here and after the King Road residence to assist with scene security and processing of a crime scene associated with four homicides. Upon our arrival, the Idaho State Police forensic team was on scene and was preparing to begin processing the scene. MPD Officer OFC Smith, one of the initial responding officers to the incident, advised he would walk me through the scene. Okay, so he has let us know um, the time of day uh, when he arrived on the scene, and now he has this other officer uh, walking him through. So Officer Smith and I entered the King Road residence through the bottom floor door on the north side of the building. Officer Smith and I then walked upstairs to the second floor. So they came in on the bottom floor, and then they walked upstairs. Officer Smith directed me down the hallway to the west bedroom on the second floor, which I later learned through Zana's driver's license and other personal belongings found in the room was um, Zana Kernodal after uh, here and after Kernodal's room. Uh, just before this room, there was a bathroom door on the south wall of the hallway. As I approached the room, I could see a body later identified as Kernodal's lying on the floor. Kernoodle was deceased with wounds which appeared to have been caused by an edged weapon. So already um, it didn't take him very long to enter into the residence and to come upon the first victim. Also in the room, same room, also in the room was a male later identified as Ethan Chapin here and after Chapin. Chapin was also deceased with wounds later identified, um, later determined sorry, and then we've got this blank page here, um, the medical examiner's report, to be caused by sharp force injuries. I then followed Officer Smith upstairs to the third floor of the residence. The third floor consisted of two bedrooms and one bathroom. The bedroom on the west side of the floor was later determined to be Kaylee um, Goncalves, and I don't know how to pronounce her last name. I later learned from review of Officer Nunez um, body camera. There was a dog in the room when Moscow police officers initially responded. The dog belonged to Kaylee and her ex-boyfriend, Jack. I found out from my interview with Jack um, on November 13, 2022, that he and Kaylee shared the dog. Officer Smith then pointed out a small bathroom on the east side of the third floor. So now, um, third floor. This bathroom shared a wall with Madison um, Mogan, here and after Mogan bedroom, which was situated on the southeast corner of the third floor. As I entered this bedroom, I could see two females in the single bed 
in the room. Both were deceased with visible stab wounds. I also later noticed what appeared to be a tan leather knife sheath laying on the bed next to one of them, right side um, when viewed from the door. The sheath was later processed and had um, K-Bar, USMC, and the United States Marine Corps Eagle Globe and anchor insignia stamped on the outside of it. The Idaho State Lab later located a single source of male DNA left on the button snap of the knife sheath. So this is the first piece of evidence really that you hear them sort of talk about um, that was at the crime scene. This sheath that the knife was in, the sheath was left there. And it makes you wonder, um, did he not see it? Did he not think to put the knife back in it? You know, what was sort of going through his head there that this somehow got left behind? So then it says, um, as part of the investigation, numerous interviews were conducted. Um, two of the interviews, and they've got initials here, were inside the King Road residence at the time of the homicides and were roommates to the victims. And they let you know um, where those were located. Okay, so here's what they're saying that they learned based on those interviews and review of the evidence. And again, um, this is Corporal. This is the corporal's statement. On the evening of November 12th, 2022, Chapin and Canoodle are seen by BF at the Sigma Chi house on the University of Ohio, Idaho campus um, at approximately 9 p.m. on November 12th to 1.45 a.m. on November 13th. BF also estimated that at approximately 1.45 a.m., Chapin and Canoodle returned to the King Road residence. BF also stated that Chapin did not live in the King Road residence, but was a guest of Canoodle. Okay, so we've got we've got the timeline now for those two and then them heading back. Gun Calvies and Mogan were at a local bar, the Corner Club at 202 North Main Street in Moscow. They can be seen in video footage provided by the club between 10 o'clock p.m. on November 12th and 1.30 a.m. on November 13th. At approximately 1.30 a.m., they can be seen on video at a local food vendor called The Grub Truck at 318 South Main Street in downtown Moscow. And this is some of the, um, this is, you know, some of the information that they already had that we had seen um, in some of the news reports as we had been getting updates. It says the Grub Truck live streams video from their food truck on the streaming platform Twitch, which is available for public viewing on their website. The, this video was captured by law enforcement. A private party reported that he provided a ride to both of them at around um, 1.56 a.m. from um, that downtown area where the food truck is to the King Road residence. So that's what he's saying there. So now we have the timeline here um, for the other two. DM and BF both made statements during interviews that indicated the occupants of the King Road residence were at home by 2 a.m. and asleep or at least in their rooms by approximately 4 a.m. This is with the exception of Canoodle, who received a DoorDash order at the residence at approximately 4 a.m. Um, and law enforcement identified the DoorDash delivery driver who reported this information. Now, that was not something that I was aware of. Like I said, um, I've been somewhat keeping up with this, but it was so tragic. It was just a lot to sort of take in to see, you know, these young, to see this happen to them. DM stated she originally went to sleep in her bedroom on the southeast side of the second floor. So she's on the second floor. Um, DM stated she was awoken at approximately 4 a.m. by what she stated sounded like. Um, Gun Calvi's playing with her dog in one of the upstairs bedrooms, which was located, which were located on the third floor. A short time later, DM said she heard who she thought was Gun Calvi's say something to the effect of there's someone here. A review of records obtained from a forensic download of Cornoodle's phone showed this could also have been Cornoodle as her cellular phone indicated she was likely awake and using the TikTok app at approximately 4.12 a.m. 
DM said that she looked out of her bedroom, did not see anything when she heard the comment about someone being in the house. DM stated she opened her door a second time when she heard what she thought was crying coming from Kendall's room. DM then said she heard a male voice say something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm going to help you. At approximately 4.17 a.m., a security camera located at 1112 King Road, a residence immediately to the northwest of 1122, which is where they were, King Road, picked up distorted audio of what sounded like voices or a whimper followed by a loud thud. A dog can also be heard barking numerous times starting at 4.17 a.m. The security camera is, left, is less than 50 feet from the west wall of Cornoodle's bedroom. So now we have um, this outside information, a security camera at another residence that um, is now providing some of the evidence that um, they've included here. DM stated she opened the door for a third time after she heard the crying and saw a figure clad in black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. DM described the figure as 5'10 or taller, male, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. The male walked past DM as she stood in a frozen shock phase. The male walked towards the black sliding glass door. DM locked herself in her room after seeing the male. DM did not say that she recognized the male. This leads investigators to believe that the murderer left the scene. Okay, so let's stop um, there for just a second because that's the part that's really hard because she has heard this these sounds. Then she has heard this whimpering. She's heard someone say, I think somebody's here. She um, has heard this male voice. And the thing about it was she didn't say that it was a voice that she recognized. She just said, I heard someone say this. And then to be walking there and to see this person go by um, can only leave you in a position of shock because now you realize that something has probably happened and you are in your residence, which is supposed to be your safe space, you're here now with this person and you don't know if this person is now going to turn around and do something to you. So this is very, this is very hard um, to read and to just get a sense of what she was feeling at that moment in time. All right, the combination of DM's statements to law enforcement, reviews of forensic downloads of records from BF and DM's phone and video of suspect video as described below, leads investigators to believe the homicides occurred between 4 a.m. and 4.25 a.m. During the processing of the crime scene, investigators found a latent shoe print. This was located during the second processing of the crime scene by the ISP forensic team by first using a presumptive blood test and then amino black, which is a protein stain that detects the presence of cellular material. You guys, this is, you know, crime scene investigations here will pick up just about anything. The detected shoe print showed a diamond shaped pattern similar to the pattern of a Vans type shoe sole just outside the door of DM's bedroom located on the second floor. This is consistent with DM's statement regarding the suspect's path of travel. And I can imagine um, that, you know, during a trial, they would present, you know, how they think the suspect entered, where the suspect stood based on this shoe print and um, her visualization of what she saw. As part of the investigation and extensive search commonly referred to in law enforcement as a video canvas was conducted in the area of the King Road residence. This video canvas was to obtain any footage from the early morning hours of November 13, 2022 in the area of King Road residence and surrounding neighborhoods in an effort to locate the suspects or suspect vehicles traveling to or leaving the King Road residence. This video canvas resulted in the collection of numerous surveillance surveillance videos in the area from both residential and business addresses. I have reviewed numerous videos that were collected and have had conversations with other MPD officers, ISP detectives, and FBI agents that are similarly reviewing footage that was obtained. You guys, you can't go anywhere. These cameras are everywhere. I, a review of camera footage indicated that a white sedan here and after suspect vehicle one was observed traveling westbound in the 700 block of Indian Hills Drive in Moscow 
at approximately 3.26 a.m. and westbound on Steiner Avenue at Idaho State Highway 95 in Moscow at approximately 3.28. On this video, it appeared suspect vehicle one was not displaying a front license plate. A review of footage from multiple videos obtained from the King Road neighborhood showed multiple sightings of suspect vehicle one starting at 3.29 a.m. and ending at 4.20 a.m. These sightings show suspect vehicle one makes an initial three passes by the 1122 King Road residence and then leave via Willenta Drive. Based off of my experience as a patrol officer, this is a residential neighborhood with a very limited number of vehicles that travel in the area during the early morning hours. Upon review of the video, there are only a few cars that enter and exit this area during this time frame. Yeah, so that's a, you know, that's the thing. When it's something that's in this sort of time frame, when people aren't usually out, your vehicle is going to stand out and there, there are going to be fewer vehicles for law enforcement to have to focus on because it is 3 and 4 a.m. in the morning and people aren't really out and about yet. It's not like it's 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. in the morning and everybody's traveling. And so once you do this video canvas, you can take a look at who's passing by when and how many times. And it's a lot easier to do that because there's less traffic. Suspect vehicle one can be seen entering the area a fourth time um, at approximately 4.04 a.m. The fourth time, the fourth time they, oh, you know, they're looking at this and this just looks suspicious. This just does. At this time of the morning, you're going through four times now. You're not delivering newspaper. It can be seen driving eastbound on King Road, stopping and turning around in front of 500 Queen Road, number 52 and then driving back westbound on King Road. When suspect vehicle one is in front of the King Road residence, it appeared to unsuccessfully attempt to park or turn around in the road. The vehicle then continued to the intersection of Queen Road and King Road, where it can be seen completing a three-point turn and then driving eastbound again down Queen Road. So they are really tracking this vehicle. Suspect vehicle one is seen departing the area of King Road residence at approximately 4.20 a.m. Okay, so now they have that vehicle leaving the area and it says at a high rate of speed. Suspect vehicle one is next observed traveling southbound on Willenta Drive. Based on my knowledge of the area, review of camera footage in the neighborhood that does not show suspect vehicle one during that time frame. I believe that suspect vehicle one likely exited the neighborhood at Palouse River Drive and Con Conestoga Drive. Palouse River Drive is at the southern edge of Moscow and proceeds into Whitman County, Washington. Eventually, the road leads to Pullman, Washington. Pullman, Washington is approximately 10 miles from Moscow, Idaho. I'm going to have to pull out a map and take a look at this. Both Pullman and Moscow are small college towns and people commonly travel back and forth between them. Law enforcement officers provided video footage of suspect vehicle one to forensic examiners with the FBI that regularly, oh, I totally just uh, lost something there. And let's see if we can get my power back on. And this is probably going to be loud. Law enforcement officers provided video footage of suspect vehicle one to forensic examiners with the FBI that regularly utilize surveillance footage to identify the year, make, and model of an unknown vehicle that is observed by one or more cameras during the commission of a criminal offense. The forensic examiner has approximately 35 years law enforcement experience with 12 years at the FBI. His specific training includes identifying unique characteristics of vehicles, and he uses a database that gives visual clues of vehicles across states to identify differences between vehicles. Yeah. Um, so this is always, you know, the record keeping around vehicles is always going to provide additional information. And of course, like I said before, it's not like there were traffic jams going on at 4 15 a.m in the morning after reviewing the numerous observations of suspect vehicle one the forensic examiner initially believed that suspect vehicle one was a 2011 to 2013 hyundai elantra upon further review he indicated it could also be a 
2011 to 2016 Hyundai Elantra. As a result, investigators have been reviewing information on persons in possession of a vehicle that is a 2011 to 2016 white Hyundai Elantra. All right, investigators were given access to video footage on the Washington State University campus located in Pullman, Washington, because that's the route uh, this person was taking back. A review of that video indicated that at approximately 2.44 a.m. on November 13, 2022, a white sedan, which is consistent with the description of the white Elantra known as Suspect Vehicle 1, was observed on um, WSU surveillance cameras traveling north on Southeast Nevada Street at Northeast Stadium Way. At approximately 2.53 a.m., a white sedan, which is consistent with the description of the white Elantra, known as Suspect Vehicle 1, was observed traveling southeast on Nevada Street in Pullman, Washington, towards um, State Road 270. 270 connects Pullman, Washington to Moscow, Idaho. This camera footage from Pullman, Washington, was provided to the same FBI forensic examiner the forensic examiner identified the vehicle observed in Pullman, Washington as being a 2014 to 2016 Hyundai Elantra. Okay, so they are narrowing this down again. And here's um, just something to sort of keep in mind, because I think we know this, but um, I mean, we know this, but it's not until it's not until it's in front of you where you think about it, security cameras are everywhere. And even though people think they know, you know, when and where they're, they're being seen, for instance, you know, they walk into an airport, they know they're being seen, they go into, um, you know, a bank, they know they're being seen, but people forget about all of the cameras that are on the exterior of buildings. So just about every government building now has a camera post offices, banks. So anytime you're going through a commercial area, they are going to have cameras, universities, numerous cameras. Why? Because they're concerned about the security of their students. And so they've gone the extra yard to um, put up even more cameras. So you have um, traffic signals now at intersections where there's a lot of traffic cameras there. Now, now they did say that these were two small towns, so there might not as have been as many traffic cameras, but as you can imagine, as you can actually see as we're talking about this, um, that video canvas, that video canvas was one of the things that um, really was led them to be able to, to narrow down who and what they were looking for. All right, let's go back here. And yes, my battery has kicked in, so I guess I better speak a little louder. At approximately 5.25 a.m., a white sedan, which is consistent with the description of suspect vehicle one, was observed on five, ca five cameras in Pullman, Washington, and on WSU campus cameras. The first camera that recorded the white sedan was located at 1300 Johnson Road in Pullman. The white sedan was observed traveling northbound on Johnson Road. Johnson Road leads directly back to West Palouse River Drive in Moscow, which intersects with Conestoga Drive. The white sedan was then observed turning north on Bishop Boulevard and northwest on SR 270. At approximately 5.27 a.m., the white Elantra was observed on cameras traveling northbound on Stadium Drive at Nevada Street, Stadium Way at Grimes Way, Stadium Drive at Wilson Road, and Stadium Way at Cougar Way. You guys, they tracked this vehicle. Like I said before, this it is just not hard to do today. Um, throw in some cell phones and, you know, so they've now got this picture here um, that's hard to, to see um, on this document, but you can see here, um, I believe maybe these are the cameras. It's, it's sort of, it's this depiction showing Moscow and Pullman. And so I think one um, town is here and then the other town is here. And this may have been the way that was traveled. Maybe that, maybe that's um, what they're showing there. It's a little hard to see here. And it says uh, depiction showing White Elantra's path of travel, not to scale. So let's see here, okay. So it says, um, this is Northeast Valley Road here. The arrows are camera locations and indicate vehicle direction and travel. This is Washington State University here. 
And this is um, Pullman here. This is white Elantra seen leaving WSU campus and then white Elantra seen coming back. So this is it coming back to campus here where you see the red here. And then where you see like the yellow here is where you see it leaving. On November 25th, 2022, MPD asked area law enforcement agencies, let's see where we are here, law enforcement agencies to be on the lookout for white Hyundai Elantras in the area. On November 29th, 2022, at approximately 12.28 a.m., Washington State University police officer Daniel Tiango queried white Elantras registered at WSU. Remember, you know, when these students go on campus, they usually have to get parking passes. If they get a parking pass, there is going to be a record of the vehicle, the vehicle owner. It says, um, as a result of that query, he located a 2015 white Elantra with a Pennsylvania license plate. This vehicle was registered to Brian Koberger, here after Koberger, residing at 1630 Northeast Valley Road, apartment 201, Pullman, Washington. This uh, location is approximately three quarters of a mile from the intersection of Stadium Way and Cougar Way. And that is the last camera location that picked up the white Elantra. That same day at approximately 12.58 a.m., WSU officer Curtis Whitman was looking for a white Hyundai Elantras, was looking for white Hyundai Elantras and located a 2015 white Hyundai Elantra at 1630 Northeast Valley Road in Pullman in the parking lot. 1630 Northeast Valley Road is an apartment complex that houses WSU students. Officer Whitman also ran the car and returned, and it returned to Coburg with a Washington tag. Or, um, I reviewed Coburg's, okay, so they kind of got that uh, little typo there. Washington State driver license information and photograph. The license indicates that Koberger is a white male with a height of six feet and approximately 185 pounds. Additionally, the photograph of Koberger shows that he has bushy eyebrows. Koberger's physical description is consistent with the description of the male DM saw inside the King Road residence on November 13th. Further investigation, including a review of the county sheriff deputy's uh, body cam and reports showed that on August 21st, 2022, Brian Koberger was detained as part of a traffic stop that occurred in Moscow, Idaho by Corporal Duke. At that time, Koberger, who was the sole occupant, was driving a white 2015 Hyundai Elantra with Pennsylvania plate, which was set to expire on November 30th, 2022. During the stop, which was recorded via a law enforcement body camera, Koberger provided his phone number um, as his cellular telephone number. Investigators conducted electronic database queries and learned that that number is a number that's issued by AT&T. On October 14th, 2022, Brian Koberger was detained as part of a traffic stop by a Washington State University police officer. Upon review of that body cam and report of the stop, Koberger was the sole occupant and was driving a white 2015 Hyundai Elantra with Pennsylvania plate. On November 18, 2022, according to Washington State Licensing, Koberger registered the 2015 white Elantra with Washington and later received a Washington plate. Prior to this time, the 2015 white Elantra was registered in Pennsylvania, which does not require a front license plate to be displayed. This was learned through communications with a Pennsylvania officer who is currently certified with the state of Pennsylvania. Based on my experience and communication with Washington law enforcement, I know that Idaho and Washington require front and back license plates to be displayed. So he's breaking down this whole thing with, um, the footage about the vehicle not having a front plate. So Idaho requires it, Washington requires it, but Pennsylvania doesn't. And he initially had this registration that was Pennsylvania. And then at the end of November, got this Washington um, registration. So now he has front and back, whereas before he didn't have to have it, okay? Because it was Pennsylvania. So um, the corporal is breaking this down so that we understand, you know, what's going on with the, the ownership regarding the car. Investigators believe that Koberger is still driving the 2015 white Elantra because his vehicle was captured on December 13, 2022 by a license plate reader in Loma, Colorado, information provided by a query to a database. 
Coburger Zalantra was then queried on December 15, 2022 by law enforcement in Hancock County, Indiana. On December 16, 2022, at approximately 226, surveillance video showed Kohlberger's Elantra in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. The sole occupant of the vehicle was a white male whose description was consistent with Kohlberger. Kohlberger has family in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, learned through a TLO search and locate tool database query. Based on information provided by the WSU website, Koberger is currently a PhD student in criminology at Washington <laughs> State University. Okay, so now we move from talking about um, from talking about the vehicle and the ownership and the pathway that he took, and they're now moving this to you know him as a student at Washington State University. And I think this is going to, again, provide even more substance um, that, yes, for, for what they are trying, trying to do here in order to show that he was the person who was um, responsible for this. All right, let's head back over here to, um, to this affidavit. Based on information, okay, so pursuant to, like I said, he is currently a PhD student in criminology, in criminology of all things, at Washington State University, pursuant to records provided by a member of the interview panel for Pullman Police Department, we learned that Koberger's past education included undergraduate degrees in psychology and cloud-based forensics. These records also showed Koberger wrote an essay when he applied for an internship with the Pullman Police Department in the fall of 2022. Koberger wrote in his essay that he had an interest in assisting rural law enforcement agencies with how to better collect and analyze technological data in public safety operations. Koberger also posted a Reddit survey, which can be found by an open source internet search. The survey asked for participants to provide information to, quote, understand how emotions and psychological traits influence decision making when committing a crime. So, you know, this is very concerning um, to read because to some extent, it almost sounds like he was trying to place himself in a position where, you know, and I don't want to, um, I don't want to come up with all these bad things in my head, but the idea that he was applying, applying for an internship with a police department and then, you know, writing that he's trying to understand about emotions and psychological traits when it comes to committing a crime. And then this is what he's actually doing. This is all very, um, it's very shocking. As part of this investigation, law enforcement obtained search warrants to determine cellular devices that utilized cell towers in close proximity to the King Road residence on November 13th, 2022, between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. After determining that Koberger was associated to both the 2015 White Elantra and the phone number, investigators reviews, reviewed these search warrant returns. A query of the phone number um, in these returns did not show the phone utilizing cellular tower resources in close proximity to the King Road residence between 3 a.m. and 5. So there's a gap there. His phone's not showing up during that time period in that area. Based on my training and experience and conversations with law enforcement officers that specialize in the utilization of cellular tel telephone records as part of investigations, individuals can either leave their cellular telephone at a different location before committing a crime or turn their, their cellular telephone off prior to going to a location to commit a crime. This is done by subjects in an effort to avoid alerting law enforcement that a cellular device associated with them was in a particular area where a crime is committed. Everybody knows that now. Everybody knows you can track um, via cell towers to narrow down the location of the phone. And that typically means the person associated with the phone, because usually now we have our phones on us just about every place we go. And so if we all of a sudden go silent on a phone, it's usually because we're trying to hide where we are. That is what um, 
is being alleged here in this document. This is done by subjects in an effort to avoid, um, I think I just read that, but this is done by subjects in an effort to avoid alerting law enforcement that a cellular device associated with them was in a particular area where a crime is committed. I also know that on numerous occasions, subjects will surveil an area where they intend to commit a crime prior to the date of the crime. Depending on the circumstances, this can be done a few days before or for several months prior to the commission of a crime. During these types of surveillance, it is possible that an individual would not leave their cellular telephone at a separate location or turn it off since they do not plan to commit the offense on that particular day. So this is where people get caught. OK, they think they think they're being smart. They're saying, you know, I'm going to go commit the crime. So I'm going to make sure I don't take my cell phone or I turn my phone off once I leave this place and I turn it back on when I get just about back or something like that. And they think they're being smart, but they forget all of those times before where they've checked out that place and they forget that their records will show that their cell phone has been back there numerous times. And so that can be one of those things that definitely um, will trip them up and get them caught. And that is what he's saying here. So on December 23rd, 2022, I applied for and was granted a search warrant for historical phone records between November 12th, 2022 at 12 a.m. and November 14th at 12 a.m. for the phone held by the phone provider, AT&T. Um, on December 23rd, these people are working hard right up to Christmas. On December 23rd, 2022, and let me, maybe I can tone that down a little bit. I don't know how long that'll last. On December 23rd, 2022, pursuant to that search warrant, I received records for the phone number. These records indicated that the phone is subscribed to Brian Koberger at an address in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, and the account has been open since June 22nd, 2022. These records also included historical cell site information location for that phone. After receiving this information, I consulted with an FBI special agent that is certified as a member of the cellular analysis survey team. Members of CAST are certified with the FBI to provide expert testimony in the field of historical um, cell, cell, cell site location information, CSLI, and are required to pass extensive training that includes both written and practical examinations prior to being certified with CAST as well as the completion of yearly certification requirements, you know, as you pretty much expect. Additionally, the FBI CAST um, special agent that I consult has over 15 years of federal law enforcement experience, which includes six years with the FBI. From information provided by CAST, I was able to determine estimated locations for the phone from November 12th to November 13th, the time period which was authorized by the court um, for this search warrant. On November 13th, 2022, at approximately 2.42 a.m., the phone was utilizing cellular resources that provide coverage to 1630 Northeast Valley Road, apartment G201, Pullman, Washington, and this is the Coburg Coburger residence. At approximately 2.47 a.m., the phone utilized cellular services that provide coverage southeast of the Coburger residence, consistent with the phone leaving the Coburger residence and traveling south through Pullman, Washington. This is consistent with the movement of the white Elantra. So they are laying this out. It's the car, it's his phone, and so therefore it's probably him. At approximately 2.47 a.m., the phone stops reporting to the network. You turn your phone off at 2.47 a.m., okay? When you're out somewhere, like, that doesn't even make sense. Okay, so let me stop here for a second. Um, because here's the thing. Here's why this doesn't make sense. If you're going out at 2.47 a.m., you're more likely going to have your phone on in case something happens to you. Because usually, you know, if things are happening, it's when it's dark, it's late, there are less people around, something might happen, you might get stranded. You want to make sure you have your phone on, your phone is charged, you have a cord so that you can plug it in. Because you don't want to get stranded. It's December. It's kind of chilly out. Yeah. Yeah. So who's going to turn their phone off then? If anything, you're making sure that your phone is on. So just think that one through. 
if, if yeah, and, and determine whether or not you think that makes any sense. This is consistent with the movement of the white Elantra. At approximately 2.47 a.m., the phone stops reporting to the network, which is consistent with either the phone being in an area without cellular coverage, the connection to the network is disabled, or the phone is turned off. The phone, his phone supposedly, does not report to the network again until approximately 4.48 a.m., at which time it utilized cellular resources that provide coverage to ID State Highway 95 south of Mos Moscow, Idaho, near Blaine, Idaho. Between 4.50 a.m. and 5.26 a.m., the phone utilizes cellular resources that are consistent with the phone traveling south on ID State Highway 95 um, to Genesee, Idaho, and then traveling west towards Uniontown, Idaho, and then north back to Pullman, Washington. At approximately 5.30 a.m., the phone is utilizing resources that provide coverage to Pullman, Washington, and consistent with the phone traveling back to the Kohlberger residence. The phone's movements are consistent with the movements of the white Elantra that is observed traveling north on Stadium Drive at approximately 5.27 a.m. This is based on a review of the phone's estimated locations and travel. The phone's travel is consistent with that of the white Elantra. What did I just say? They're making these parallel together, traveling together. Further review indicated that the Phone utilized cellular resources on November 13th that are consistent with the phone leaving the area of the Coburger residence at approximately 9 a.m. and traveling to Moscow in uh, Idaho. Specifically, the phone utilized cellular resources that would provide coverage to the King Road residence between 9.12 a.m. and 9.21 a.m. The phone next utilized cellular resources that are consistent with the phone traveling back to the area of the Coburger residence and arriving to the area at approximately 9.00 a.m. 32 a.m. So what they're showing is this other visit to that area. Remember, um, let me go back for a second. Um, phone's not off, okay? Because that's what they're saying. These other times, you know, people forget to turn the phone off. So then we have a depiction of the pos possible route here. This is a possible route based off cellular device location. Investigators found that the phone did not connect to a cell phone tower that provides service to Moscow on November 14, 2022, but investigators do not believe that the phone was in Moscow on that date. The phone has not connected to any towers that provide service to Moscow since that date. Based on my training experience, the facts of the investigation thus far, I believe that Coburger used the phone the user of the phone was likely the driver of the white Elantra that is observed departing Pullman, Washington, and that this vehicle is likely suspect vehicle one. Additionally, the route travel of the phone during the early morning hours of November 13th and the lack of the phone reporting to AT&T between 2.47 a.m. and 8.40 and 4.48 is consistent with Koberger attempting to conceal his location during the quadruple homicide that occurred at the King Road residence. On December 23rd, 2022, I was granted a search warrant for Coburger's historical CSLI from June 23rd to um, 2022 to current prospective location information and a pen registered trap and trace on the phone to aid in efforts to determine if Coburger had stalked any of the victims in this case prior to the events, conducted surveillance on the King Road residence, was in contact with any of the victim's associates before or after the alleged offense, any locations that may contain evidence of the murders that occurred on November 13th, the location of the White Elantra belonged to Koberger as well as the location. So now they're going back because they want to know, like I said, hey, if there are gaps, it looks like he was turning them off. Um, if they're not gaps, then it looks like maybe he was stalking on or surveilling. On uh, December 23rd, 2022, pursuant to that search warrant, I received historical records for the phone from AT&T from the time the account was opened in June 22. So this hasn't, it's not like my account. My account would go back for decades. Um, from the AT&T, from the time the account was opened in June 2022, after consulting with CAS special agent, I was able to determine estimated locations for the phone from June 22nd, 
to the present time period, um, to the time period offered by the court. And let's see, the records for the phone show that the phone utilizing cellular resources that provide coverage to the area of 1122 King Road on at least 12 occasions prior to November 13, 2022. All of these occasions, except for one, occurred in the late evening and early morning hours of their respective days. On, uh, let's see, one of these occasions was August 21, 2022. The phone utilized cellular resources providing coverage to the King Road residents from approximately 10.34 p.m. to 11.35 p.m. At approximately 11.37 p.m., Coburger was stopped by Latah County Sheriff's Deputy Corporal Duke, as mentioned above. The phone was utilizing cellular resources consistent with the location of the traffic stop during this time. Further analysis of the cellular data provided showed the phone utilized cellular resources on November 13th, consistent with the phone traveling from Pullman, Washington to Lewiston, Idaho via U.S. Highway 195. At approximately 12.36 p.m., the phone utilized cellular resources that would provide coverage to Kate's Cup of Joe coffee stand located at 810 Port Drive, Clarkston, Washington. Surveillance footage from the U.S. Chef's store located at 820 Port Drive, Clarkston, Washington and adjacent to Kate's Cup of Joe showed a white Elantra consistent with suspect vehicle one drive past Kate's Cup of Joe at a time consistent with the cellular data from the phone. At approximately 1246, the phone then utilized cellular data in the area of Albertson's grocery store. So remember, I told you all of these businesses now have, um, you know, um, cameras and, 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 and you've got these towers. So now they're able to look at where the towers are and then see, you know, and, and put these two together. You just cannot hide. You cannot hide. Surveillance footage obtained from the Albertsons showed Kohlberger exit the white Elantra. So now they've put him getting out of that vehicle. Consistent with suspect vehicle one at approximately 1249 p.m. Interior surveillance camera showed Kohlberger walk through the store, purchase unknown items at the checkout and leave at approximately 104 p.m. And then they're showing his path of travel there. Okay. So now you have gone inside the store. And so now they've got your phone records. Um, they've got the cell tower records. They've done the video canvas. And now they've got you inside a store. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is all of the information that they're putting together here to make a case. Additional analysis of records for the phone indicated that between approximately 5.32 p.m. and 5.36 p.m., the phone utilized cellular resources that provide coverage to Johnson, Idaho. The phone then stops reporting to the network from approximately 5.36 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. That is consistent with the phone being um, with the phone being in the area that the phone traveled in the hours immediately following the suspected time the homicides occurred. December 27, 2022, Pennsylvania agents recovered the trash from Coburger family residence located in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. That evidence was sent to the Idaho State Lab for testing. On December 28, 2022, the Idaho State Lab reported that a DNA profile obtained from the trash and the DNA profile obtained from the sheath identified a male as not being excluded as the biological father of suspect profile. At least 99.9998% of the male population would be expected to be excluded from the possibility of being the suspect's biological father. Based on the information above, I'm requesting an arrest warrant be issued for Brian C. Koberger. You have his date of birth address and four counts of murder in the first degree for um, the victims listed there. So there you have it. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot. But um, but you see how they really used technology, how they really used the location of the vehicle, tracking it with information from the cell phone towers, the cell phone information from the video canvas and throwing all of this information in here together in order to um, get this arrest for him. So. 
hopefully that brings you up to speed um, with this document that was just released. Go ahead and give the video a thumbs up if you now know a little bit more about what's going on. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.